The first thing that you're going to want to do is to get your pictures open in Photoshop. Now these computers, when you're on the Mac side, are going to default if you double click on any JPEG file. They don't open Photoshop, but they open up the application called Preview. So you don't want to double click on them because I've had over the years a number of people double click on files and they're like, well, it's not in Photoshop. Where are my Photoshop tools and why is it not working and so on and so forth. So we don't need to go at it that way. Instead, what you can do is you can even highlight multiple files. You know, just click and drag it to select multiple files and you can drag them to the Photoshop icon down on your dock and once you do that you'll notice that they then open up in individual tabs and well, I'm, I'm going to move off that picture that was a little disturbing because that's going to give someone nightmares I think. But we can see now we have these individual pictures occurring here and they're all in little tabs and I can just go between them to see the different photos. Now one thing that you will notice if you work on Windows, Windows typically will load applications into what's called the application frame. Where on the Macintosh it's a relatively recent feature that they've added to some of these programs is being able to use the application frame. So when I look here I can still see my web browser, I can see the finder window, if I had a different program I could see that. And it's just a cluttered messy workspace. So if I go under the window pull down menu I can actually choose application frame right here. And it adds a nice feature that makes this look more like a Windows application. So it floats it all into this big gray window here. And if I want I can, if I can find the corner, I can make the whole thing bigger and smaller. But you know, it floats it in the application frame. So it's a nice way of working because now it's a less cluttered workspace. So I'm a big fan of it and I'm happy that Adobe added that to my program because that makes it a lot easier to use in my opinion. Some Mac people were upset because it makes it seem more Windows-esque, but Adobe quickly pointed out that Apple added the application frame to its software years ago, long before Adobe added it to Photoshop. So uh, that silenced people pretty quickly. So when I look at Photoshop, we're going to do a quick guided tour of where the different things are in Photoshop, and I'm noticing it's remembering a little bit of uh, working this morning. So anytime you work in the program and you may drag things around, you're like, whoa, something's in the way, so I need to move that, and I need to move that, and I need to move this, and I need to move this over to here, and I need to move this over to here. Because there are some of you who are those draggers. You like to drag around your user interface a little bit to make room. I'm looking for this, so you drag it. Then you'll drag this back over so you can see this, and you drag this over. That's fine. But as you can see, it's gotten a little cluttered. One thing that will happen periodically, I'll walk over to work with you and realize your workspace is a disaster and I can't find anything. All these palettes that I see here, I can gain access to under the window pull down menu. If you notice, certain ones have check marks next to them. That means they're visible. If I say choose info, that comes up and now here's the info palette. I can set that over here. Now if you look at the info palette, you will notice that the info palette has RGB, it has CMYK. And if I move my cursor or mouse over my image, you will see that I'm getting different information. Since I move into black or very dark, my CMYK all go up to high percentages, but my RGB values go down very low. RGB will be measured in a value of 0 to 255, while CMYK is measured in a percentage of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. If I move into red, you will see that red went up high and green and blue are down low. If I go into flesh, it's closer to white, so I, but more red than green and blue. If I go into a blue color, I can see well, it's showing up as gray. It's not a good blue. There's some green hiding in the background. So I can fit that. Oh, that's in a different window. That's why it's not working. But I can see these different colors. Now this workspace I've made a rack out of. And I want to reset it. Top of the screen up here says the word essentials. And it says, ooh, select a workspace. The little thing popping up is called a tooltip. I use tooltips all the time in Photoshop. And I've spent way too many hours of my life hacking through this program. And I still use tooltips. So I will put my mouse over something and wait for the tooltip to come up and tell me what that tool is. 
eraser tool, crop tool, quick selection tool, lasso tool, marquee tool, move tool. So I wait for those tool tips of, oh, what tool am I looking for? Use the tool tips to help you. But up here, it says, hey, select a workspace. I can click on the arrow next to it, and I can choose Reset Essentials. This resets it to the factory default. So now it's been reset at the factory default. So the view I have now is the same one when I started my day. So it's really useful to reset your workspace at times. It's also really useful to customize your workspace. I customize my workspace at home all the time. I rarely do it in the classroom because I like to use the default settings so that your computer matches my computer. Or my computer matches yours would be more accurate. But it's very common for people to make a mess out of things. So pull down menus on the top of the screen. When you are looking for something in Photoshop, you click on a pull down menu and you look for it. Now we're not going to use all of these. We're not using the analysis menu. We're not using 3D. If you're really versed in this program and want to use 3D, go nuts, but I'm not teaching it. So it's up to you to figure it out then. View, we might use. Window, probably. Filter, certainly. Select, certainly. Layer, generally anything we need out of layer, we get off the layer palette, so we're not going to use the layer pull down. Image, yes. Edit, yes. File, yes. So we'll use some of these, but not all of them. So if you're like freaking out about, oh my gosh, that's so many commands, and what do I do? Don't worry. Take your breath. Chill because there's a certain workflow we're going to explore in here. There's usually at least six different ways to do the exact same operation in Photoshop. So if you talk to six different people who know this program well, they will tell you six different ways to get the same result. That's how it works. The most important thing is don't be afraid to push the button. Click on it, push the button, because the worst that can happen is You just have to undo what you just did. So if I go grab myself a paintbrush, which if we look at the tools on the left-hand side of the screen, I have selection tools. There's a little gray bar. Then I have content creation tools, like the paintbrush. Then I have vector tools. We'll use the text tool a little bit. Otherwise, we won't really use those much. And then I have some kind of manipulation tools, the hand magnifier, things like that. And we'll take a look at those shortly. So if I grab a paintbrush, up at the top of the screen, I can see now I have paintbrush options. If I grab my marquee tool, I have marquee options. If I grab the lasso tool, I get options for lasso tool. So right up here is my tool control bar where it gives me the options for a given tool. It will change no matter what tool I select. So when you're wondering about how to modify a tool while you're working with it, all you have to do is look up at this bar up at the top here and make your change. So if I grab my paintbrush, I'm going to then choose a brush size. I'm going to choose a big brush, just a big fat square brush, nice and hard. No, that's not big enough. And I can see the preview on screen showing me how big it is. Currently my color that it's going to paint with is green. Now I clicked on my color swatch and if I look over here, it now is showing me in the color picker, I can choose HSB, RGB. Lab, we're not going to worry about that today, and CMYK. So as I choose different colors, we can see all those values change. So I can change my hue. So I'm going to paint with, I'm going to paint with a green color. I'm going to choose a really bright green. And now if I paint here, whoa, look at this. Oh, look at I scribbled all over the image. Oh no. Oh no. It's a tragedy. I choose a different color, scribble all over the image. I've lost them forever. Now it used to be back in the day, the only recourse I had available to me is I would have to then revert my file to the previous saved version. Because Photoshop only supported one layer or one level of undo. And it was version about 5.5 where Adobe finally said, you know, maybe we will let you have multiple undos. And they introduced something called the history palette. So now every time I grab a color, paint, paint, paint. 
So each one of these now I have to put on screen here. Right over here happens to be the history palette, or if I go under window and I can then choose history, and it comes up, pops out the history palette. I'm going to stretch that window bigger. So when you see a window, the little corner down here, and this is a common user interface or UI option, when you see the little kind of marks in the corner, that will often indicate that you can just grab and drag that to make it bigger. That's a common thing in most UIs that you'll find that for controlling a window. Now I can look and it shows me the different things I did. Brush tool, brush tool, brush tool, brush tool, brush tool. So I can actually step back through time. One brush stroke at a time. And it's really cool. And if I wasn't using the brush, if I did a brush and an eraser and a stamp and a pattern and just did a whole series of operations, I would see each one of those defined in that history palette. And I can work my way back or I can go back forward and then go in a new direction with it. And we'll see that now what was the future disappeared because I've now followed a new fork. I've rewritten history. So it's kind of like going back in time and then going down a different road. So it's really kind of a fun way of thinking about it, I think. And then you can just work your way through and get back to where you need to be. So the history palette's really cool. Now when you're working in Photoshop, a lot of people like to be keyboard shortcut snobs. If you work in Photoshop and you use only pull down menus and pop out menus that come from that and dialog boxes, it's going to take you considerable more time to arrive at your final destination than if you learn a few keyboard shortcuts specifically to do simple operations and to select your different tools as you need them. I am not going to test you on keyboard shortcuts. You're not going to be mandated to learn them. But down the road, if you use this program often enough, I highly encourage you to do that. Most of the time, you'll find that your left hand should reside not in your lap or on your forehead, but it should be on the bottom left corner of the keyboard where you have access to the modifier keys of X or Z, X, C, and V. If you look at the keyboard, Z, X, C, and V corresponds to undo, cut, copy, paste. Four very common things we do on the computer, and you'll also notice we have control, option, and command down there. So if you're accessing the keyboard, these are really common ones you're going to use frequently. You're also going to frequently use things like in Photoshop, if you hit the space bar, it switches to the hand tool so you can move around an image, which if I zoom in, that becomes more important. So now I can wee and move around an image and where's someone else? Where'd they go? There we go, see? And they added this kind of throw feature, which is just kind of fun in Photoshop when you're zooming around. Uh, there's no real functionality. It just, it's kind of satisfying that you, well, didn't mean to go wide like that, but... Uh, all right, now I have to reset my workspace again. There we go. But, so when you go fast, it's just kind of fun. I don't really know what the value is. Now to zoom in and, whoop, I still have a paintbrush up. To zoom in and out on the image is Command plus and Command minus. So if you look at the keyboard, if you hold down the Command key, the one with the apple on it and the little clover sign, and then you hit the minus key, it zooms out. And if you hit the plus key, it zooms in in up to 3,200%, which is the maximum amount of zoom that Photoshop will do. So it, it's a very, uh, and now I've lost myself in the image because I'm so zoomed in. I'm going to be really, look at that, wow, zoomed way in. So when you look at this, we can now see the individual pixels or dots that compose this image. If we zoom all the way in, each one of these squares represents a piece of color, a square of color information that's one dot in my image. Combined together they create the continuous tone that we see as part of this image. So these pixels are really the bread and butter of what we're talking about here and working with those pixels. Now I can work with my paintbrush and make my brush really, 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 really small. So my brush is only one pixel in size, or easier or better, I use the pencil tool. And now I can see I can even paint one pixel at a time within my image. So there are some people who actually choose to create artwork on their computer 
at the pixel level and they do pixel art. They typically border on what would be kind of uh, OCD because it's truly an obsessive compulsive form of working with your image. So we have tools on the left, tool options across the top, pull down menus above that, and then our palettes which show up on the right hand side of the screen. This is the basics of the UI and then we will be working more with that shortly. So while you're working on your project, what you're going to want to do when you acquire different source images, so you have your different source images, scary ones, pleasant ones, as you see fit. I have an even scarier one that I might share with you a little bit later this evening. But when you have these different things, then what I recommend that you do for working on your project is that you create a new file. So for those who are new to Photoshop, it's very important that you watch this next series of steps because this is going to be very important for you. Is to go under the File pull down menu, you will choose New, and it will come up with this window. Now mine is remembering the last settings that I used, so it's showing up at 6 inches. Now yours may show up at pixels and it will have some value in, and it will most likely be at 72 pixels per inch on your resolution. 72 pixels per inch is screen resolution. We want a document that is configured for print resolution, which is approximately four times the size. So the standard default high resolution file size is 300. There are occasions where you may use anywhere from 288 all the way up to 360, 600. When you're dealing with high-end printers, your best course of action is to talk to your printer rep, the person who represents the company who will actually be outputting your design project and say, what format, what resolution do you need? And that will make them very happy to work with you when you ask that question versus you giving them something and then they call you bad names behind your back for being an inept, uh, clueless loser. Not that they would ever do that, but they might. For your poster project, it will be six inches wide, nine inches tall, 300 pixels per inch resolution. That is going to be the size you are going to work for your poster project. So it's very important that you create a new document at that size. As you can see, that document is now portrait or vertical in orientation. It is not horizontal. Most cameras default to a horizontal alignment. So when you take the pictures and bring in pictures that you've taken yourself or pictures that you find, most of them are horizontal because that is the way that the camera is traditionally oriented when we hold it. So the task this evening is to get these people into this document. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do it, and we're going to look at a few of those. Bear in mind that we're only looking at a very small set of ways to do it. And there are many, 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 many other ways to accomplish the same thing. Now, one thing that I can do is I can use the lasso tool, and I can drag around an image, part of my image. And I can take that and go under the Edit pull-down menu, and I can choose Copy. Edit, Copy. If I go into my new image, I can then choose Edit, Paste. Well, I can try at least. Yeah. Edit, Paste. Now Joe has joined us in our new picture. Now if you notice, Joe still has a bunch of background crud around him, and I want to get rid of that. Now, I could have tried to make an accurate selection before bringing him in, or I can bring him in as is. So again, there is no only way to do it, but first I'm going to bring a couple people in. Now, I'm not bringing myself in yet. Now, this whole Motley crew that I see here, if I select this group, highlight it, if I copy that, 
Again, remembering the keyboard shortcut of undo, cut, copy, that's C on the keyboard. Command C is copy. If I go into my new composite image, Command V will be paste. Command P is for print, it's not for paste. So these keyboard shortcuts are pretty much ubiquitous in almost every software program. Undo, cut, copy, paste are always going to be those keystrokes in everything you do. Now we can see that they came in. And if I look in my layer pull down menu, or uh, layer window, I'll notice that the group of people is above the single individual. That's how the layers are ordered. And then it's white on the background layer, the bottom layer. If I want to put Joe on top, I can drag him up. And I can drag his layer up, and now you are on top of everybody else. So getting pieces into the new file is really the first order of business. The second order of business is to start cleaning up the edges. Okay, recording has begun again. If you're an old schooler, what you would have done back in the day is you would have used a true old schooler, you would use the eraser tool, and then you would work on trying to erase around the edges of your image. And, well, needless to say, oh shoot, look at it, I just took his elbow off. That's not very nice, that's kind of painful looking. And I don't really like that, so let's undo that. So I could use the eraser tool, and I could zoom way in, move myself over, and try to have a super steady hand. And I drink way too much coffee to have that steady of a hand, so that's just you know out of the question right now. That's not going to work. So there is a better way. So as I'm working with this, now what I can do to make this selection to get rid of the background, they introduced this wonderful tool called the quick select tool and I can take this quick select tool put it in my image and I need a little bigger one to start with it's like a paintbrush and I can just say I can paint this selection look at let me try that again if I put my cursor here and go click click it said oh I think you want all that gray it selected all of it two clicks oh I want this gray too oh three clicks look at that okay I want to get rid of this black four clicks Hit the delete key. Now, with the selection on, if I go into the select pull down menu and choose deselect, go to the move tool, I can now move Joe around a little bit. And you can see that I really did, in fact, get rid of all the background around him with four clicks. It really is that easy now if you use the quick select tool. Now, some people may not use the lasso, they may use the polygonal lasso tool. And if I zoom way in on something, now I'm going to turn off Joe's layer and then I will go to this other layer. And I can, with the polygonal lasso tool, I can go click, 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 click. And carpal tunneling clicks later. And, and I'm not kidding about that. I mean, it's, we're talking, my, my hand is already getting sore. And I've now more than doubled the clicks and I'm only part way around ahead. Okay, so I could you know continue on and eventually make a selection. And when I get to the end, I can click and now I get what's called the marching ants. So that shows I have a selection, the marching ants moving around the image. Polygonal lasso tool, it gives me a very rough, ugly line. Not very nice, and I'm not really a big fan of it. So let's turn off that selection and go back to the quick select tool and experiment again how it works. It's like a paintbrush so I can use square bracket tools to go down or up. So if I can click out here and it starts to go, hey I bet you wanted to select all that around him, I can say sure, thank you very much. I can zoom out and we can see it's now selected. Now this is also why I said, gee, let's stand in front of the white screen because it makes it really easy to extract people from a neutral background. If I hit the delete key, it goes away. Now on some images, it works really well. And on other images for making a selection, I'm going to zoom in and we'll work over here. 
So as I work on this image and start clicking to make my selection, click, we can see, oh, look at that. He lost some hair. That's a shame. Look at that haircut. Wow. Oh, I, I just took his head off. <laughs> see? So if I hit the delete key here, yep. Uh, we're just going to say use the background color for now and see. Look at, you know, see so how that's not a really good selection. David came out okay, but. Can't say uh, as much about the others on that one. So let's undo that here. Now when you're using the quick selection tool, what's really cool about this is I can toggle between its different modes or even easier, the normal mode, notice it has a plus in it. If I hold down the option key, it gets a minus. And now I can take this line here, this marching ant line, and I can push it back. Push it back. So effectively what I am doing is I am telling Photoshop, you know, I actually want that. And now I can click here again, but I don't want that. And each time I do that, it seems to get a little bit smarter and a little bit smarter. And what it's going to do is it's going to get really close. And with a few simple clicks, uh, whoops, wrong way. I need to push that back out. I forgot I was selecting the background not the person. But now that I've done that, we can see that it's very nicely if I hit delete with the background color this time, nobody was beheaded. So the content aware is a really nice way of getting, or not content aware, the quick selection tool is a really nice way of getting rid of things. But all this hard work that I just did, making what looks almost like the state of Texas, all this hard work happened on the background layer. So now if I select this with, say, one of my lasso tools and copy it and paste it into, I don't want all that, let's try again, paste it over. So if I copy this, paste it into my document here, we can see that that white, even though I hit delete, is still there. So my advice, so I don't have to repeat the process. Whoa, I should have looked when I was cutting on that one. I just shaved off some brain. Sorry. It happens. Um, think of it as, you know, a diet plan there. Here, we're thinning things down. So when you are working with things, let's see. Okay, so if I'm going to bring this over, my advice is either use the content aware and select the subject. And I can push out in my hand and it worked out surprisingly well. I can trim that a little bit later. So I selected the subject. Now if I copy that go over to this document Zoom out so we can see how the whole thing's shaping up. I can now paste it, grab the move tool, move it around. So we can see that I am now causing trouble yet again. Now if I want to move the other layers, I can click on those layers. I can move them around. If I want to be on top, I can grab my layer pull it up. So the tools work with whatever the current active layer is. So if I grab this, then we can see there's my current active layer. Excuse me, layer. Click here. Current active layer. So I'm going to put that one up since it had some background cut out. And so as you can see, with a little bit of work, you can start to bring your classmates together into a single unified picture. The final step that you want to do is you want to go under the file pull down menu, choose save as, and you need to change the format from Photoshop to JPEG. And then once you do that, Then you can save it. 
and upload it to D2L and put it in the Dropbox. Now it's going to prompt you for a quality setting. The default of 8 is more than fine for what we're doing. For your poster project, up it to its maximum quality when you do it, up to 12 so we get a higher quality file. Now it's very important that after you save out the JPEG that you do not throw away your Photoshop file that has all of your individual layers that are part of this. We need these layers. Do not throw this layered Photoshop file away because chances are you will finish your poster, save the JPEG, we will critique it and you will realize you want to make a few changes. Or perhaps you spelled your title wrong or you spelled other words wrong in your credits. If you leave it that way, it's going to look like junk. So it's important that you maintain this layered Photoshop file and the save as JPEG file that you turn in. So you have both. I don't want the layered Photoshop file because it will generally they work out to be about 100 megabytes in size which makes D2L really unhappy when people try and upload them. So I don't want the layered Photoshop file. I do want a JPEG but I need you to keep that until we're positive we're done with it.